think we're ready. All right, hey everyone, thanks for joining in. Um, so today is one of our National Fellow Online Lecture Series with Dr. Lee Mancini. Um, Dr. Mancini, if you can go to the next slide for us. So today we're talking about weightlifting and weightlifting injuries. I'm Dana Shang. I'm a sports medicine physician with Mercy. And then Dr. Mancini, I'll give more of an intro in the next few slides. Um, just a little plug for next week's lecture. It'll be Melody's Boards Relevant Orthobiologics. So stay tuned for that. Next slide. So as a reminder, this is an adjunct to your individual program's educational programming. So um, we wanted to give you guys a chance to hear from um, invited guest experts in a variety of formats, and this will help with your CAQ exam preparation. And remember, you guys already do this, but keep your microphones muted, turn off your video, and then even as the lecture is going, feel free to put in questions into the chat. Uh, if you want, you can include your name and program, and then at the end, I as the moderator will kind of go through these and then ask them based in the order that you guys submit them. And then also at the end, Andy will include a link to an evaluation. If you guys can fill it out, that would be awesome. So for to introduce Dr. Lee Mancini, he's been on a faculty at UMass since 2004, where he serves as the chief of the Division of Sports and Exercise Medicine, and is also the program director for the Primary Care, primary care Sports and Exercise Medicine Fellowship. He's a certified sports nutritionist and a certified strength and conditioning specialist. He serves as the head primary care sports medicine physician for the Wooster Red Sox. And as if you weren't busy enough, he's also the team physician for eight area colleges and several high schools. He has a particular interest in sports nutrition, exercise science, and strength and conditioning. With over 27 years experience as a strength coach and a certified strength and conditioning specialist, designing strength training programs for individuals and teams at the high school, collegiate, and professional levels. He also serves as a sports science and training and nutrition consultant for the Arizona Coyotes NHL franchise. So we are very lucky to have Dr. Mancini talk with us today about weightlifting and weightlifting injuries. So I'll let you take it from here. Dana, thank you so much. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here giving this lecture tonight. Uh, this is a topic that I'm extremely passionate about. And I'm happy to stay on as long after the lecture is done to answer any and all questions. Um, also, feel free to put questions in the chat. Um, I have no uh, financial or other conflicts of interest. Um, again, um, I have an extensive background in strength and conditioning, weight training, um, weightlifting, and powerlifting. Um, my goal tonight is to present a combination of both evidence and experience uh, to go over different disciplines within weightlifting to show an epidemiology of weightlifting injuries, to discuss and uh, diagnosis and management of a couple of key specific injuries, and hopefully get some actionable training advice for you and your athletes and your patients, prepare you all for your CAQ, and again, keep this very informal and ask a lot of questions. So this is sort of a, a play in three acts. Uh, the agenda tonight um, is to talk about the weightlifting disciplines first, some weightlifting definitions, and then talk about weightlifting injuries. So here are a host of very different disciplines within weightlifting as a whole. There's Olympic lifting, powerlifting, CrossFit, strongman competitions, bodybuilding, and all of these encompass some aspect of strength training. So we're going to start off with Olympic weightlifting. Um, it's been around for thousands of years. Um, Egypt, China, India, ancient Greece, uh, the first Olympic weightlifting championships were actually held in London in 1891. The first Olympic Games that had any, any sort of weightlifting event was back in Athens in 1896, but there it wasn't our traditional modern Olympic lifting. It was just a one-handed lift and a two-handed lift. It wasn't until 1828 um, that they had the three main Olympic lifts, the clean and jerk, the snatch, and the clean and press. Now you're probably thinking, wait, I haven't seen the clean and press in recent um, Olympics. And that's because it was removed in 1972. And I'll circle back to why that was the case a little bit later in our talk. Uh, the International Weightlifting Federation is the main sports governing body. 
You can see the weight classes here for both men and women in both kilograms and pounds. And again, they use judges and referees to decide if a lift is successful or not. So to break down the, the two current events, the snatch and the cleaning jerk, this is a picture of the, the snatch. You start with a, a deadlift pull from the floor with a wide, what we call a snatch grip. You have a first pull of the bar off the floor, second pull, bring the bar up closer to the shoulders. You then drop underneath into the receiving position and a deep squat. And I want everyone, as we come back around to weightlifting and Olympic lifting injuries, look at the shoulder position at the snatch in terms of that, that wide uh, position on the bar. Look at the foot position in terms of the feet turned out and look at the squat depth um, and keep that in mind when we're comparing Olympic lifting and power lifting. Here now is the clean and jerk. The clean part of the motion is on the top slide. The, snap, the jerk part is on the bottom. So when we look at the clean and jerk, here it, you have just broken down as the clean. Again, you're starting off the floor in the Olympic clean and jerk. So you're starting again in that deadlift, you know, pulling from the floor. Again, the clean grip is a, is a narrower grip than your snatch grip, but you still have a first pull lifting the bar off the ground to the mid thigh, a second pull getting it up towards the shoulders. Again, a drop phase where you're dropping under the bar, catching the bar, and receiving it in that deep squat position. Again, one of the things to compare between the clean and jerk and the snatch is how the wrist in that catch position is up here versus with the, versus with the snatch, that wide grip. From this clean motion, you then go into the jerk. And in the jerk, you're now standing up from that squat position. So you have the, the barbell across the front of your shoulders with your wrist back. That's that start position of the jerk. You dip into a quarter squat, you then drive the weight overhead. And as you drive it up, you're gonna drop under the bar again and receive it in that split stance. And so that's that, that jerk split stance where you have a lunge position where one leg is forward and one leg is back. So to put this all together, you have the clean plus the jerk. And again, some key points to look at for injury risk on the clean and jerk is that wrist position and how that wrist is bent back. Again, looking at the squat depth, just like with the snatch. And then again, that split stance component with one leg forward are all things to think about. Now, I did say the clean and press used to be part of it. Um, it was removed in 1972. And that was because if you see here on the bottom left, there were a lot of cases where people were having really poor form and there was a high rate of lower back injuries from people pressing the weight overhead and, and leaning back. So the clean and press has not been part of the Olympic weightlifting exercises since 1972. So that's an overview of the discipline of Olympic weightlifting. Moving on to powerlifting, again, this has been around since ancient Greece, Persia. In modern times, Olympic lifting was much more prominent. It wasn't up until the modern sport of powerlifting came around in the United Kingdom, the United States in the 1950s. In fact, a lot of the lifts that make up powerlifting, the, the barbell back squat, the bench press, and the deadlift were considered quote unquote odd lifts. Um, and they weren't as mainstream as Olympic lifting was in the early 20th century. In 1958, the National Weightlifting Committee of the Amateur Athletic Union, the AAU, came together and started talking about powerlifting meets. And the first national meet was held in 1964. It was sponsored by the York Barbell Company. And it's interesting, if you look up top on the top right picture, you have the, that position of, the, again, the, the clean and jerk position as the York uh, Barbell logo they were much bigger supporters of Olympic weightlifting. And as Olympic weightlifting's popularity dwindled in the midpoint of the 20th century and powerlifting took off, they ended up stepping in and being involved in powerlifting. There are a number of different powerlifting federations across the world. The main governing body or one of the biggest federations is the International Powerlifting Federation. Their website is here. They have eight main weight classes. One of the things in talking about powerlifting is the definition between raw powerlifting and equipped, and I'm going to go into detail about what this means a little bit later. The other piece in terms of judging is that there are three judges for a lift, and each judge will give 
either a white light or a red light. A white light is a successful lift, a red light is a failed attempt. And in order for a lift to be successful, you need two out of three judges to say it's a white or a successful lift. So for the squat, again, the main commands on the squat uh, for the squat when they're being judged is to squat, meaning lowering all the way down, and then to come back up and rack. Uh, again, you can see up in the top right, um, the three lights, you can see two white lights and one red light on this device for the judges. But what gives you a failure in the squat be besides being unable to actually lift the weight up? So if you get trapped in the bottom position, obviously that's a major failure. But if you're unable to lock out at, to at the top, if you adjust your feet, if you're unable to re-rack the bar on the squat rack, if at the bottom position, what we call the whole position, you try to rest your elbows on your quads. And if you don't go deep enough in your squat and for deep enough in powerlifting, the knees have to be parallel to the hip joint. And so again, it's not quite as deep as it is in Olympic lifting in the clean and jerk and the snatch. Again, for the bench press, the commands are start, meaning they take the, the bar off the rack, press, and then when they press the weight up, then rack again. And other technical failures or ways you would get a red light instead of a white light would be if you don't touch your chest with the barbell, if you lift your feet off the floor, if you put your feet on the bench, if at any point either your head, shoulders, or butt comes off the bench, if you try mid-lift to change or adjust your hand position, or if you're unable to reach lockout at the top. And then the last of the three exercises in powerlifting is the deadlift. And for the deadlift, the command is simple. The person lifts the weight up off the floor. When they're in that top position, as you see in this picture here, the judge will say down and they have to lower the weight down. A failure would result if they're unable to fully stand fully tall or stand erect, if they're unable to lock out, if they end up resting the bar on their thighs or trying to hitch the bar up, meaning sort of muscle the weight up versus a clean deadlift pull, or if they lower the weight down to the ground before one of the judges say down, if they drop the bar, and if they try to adjust their foot position mid-lift. Again, I mentioned that different federations um, in terms of powerlifting and raw versus equipped. Raw means that the person is using as little equipment as possible or minimal equipment. And this has to be an approved weightlifting belt. You can see here in that middle picture, it says International Powerlifting Federation approved. So it has to be the right type of belt, an approved singlet, and that which you see in the bottom right picture, approved knee sleeves. So you know things that are pulled up over the knee, wrist wraps, chalk, and it does vary between federations around the world what is approved or not approved, but this is raw, this is minimal equipment. Now compare that with equipped, which allows everything that we just saw on the last slide in, in a raw meet, but also they allow knee wraps instead of the knee sleeve, a squat suit, which you see in the bottom right, which is a tight compressive suit that you wear that helps you accelerate out of that bottom hole position in the squat, almost like a slingshot effect driving you up. A bench shirt, which you can see this gentleman wearing um, in the mid bottom middle picture, and you can see the bench per, uh, shirt by itself in the bottom left. And the bench shirts and the squat suits are further delineated as either single ply, meaning one layer of fabric, or multi-ply with multiple layers. And the more ply you have, the more compression you're giving and the more assistance it can help. Well, how much help you ask? So this is an article by Wilk from 2020 and it shows performance differences. This slide focuses on male athletes. The top is the world records and the bottom is at the, at the world championships from that year. And what you can see is if you were, raw, were using equipment like a squat suit, your squat, the world record is 20% higher than it is than the raw record. It's with, at the world championships, the squat was 27% higher. You can see for bench press, 31% higher. So you can bench press 30% more weight. So again, if someone's, you know, with their personal best, let's say was 500 pounds, you're adding an extra 150 pounds to that if it's 30% higher, you know, third higher. And deadlift, much more, much less help, only 12% higher in the world record 
and 8% higher in the world championships. So this is for male athletes. If you look at for female athletes now on this slide, you can see the squat 25 and 30% higher respectively for the world record and the world championship record. Bench press 40% higher the world record, 34% uh, higher in the world championships. And again, deadlift very minimal. Now, why is it such a bigger difference for the squat and bench press for men and women with using the equipment versus raw where the deadlift is a little bit less? That's because there's really only one added implement for equipment that the deadlift can use, and that's the knee straps versus the knee sleeve. Also, the deadlift, you're lifting the weight off the floor, and there's much less of an eccentric component. You're just setting the weight back down, whereas the squat and the bench press, you're either lowering the barbell to your chest on the bench, or you're lowering the weight into that bottom hole position, and you need to have some some power to get in that, some elastic stretch reflex to get that out. And that's why the squat with the squat suit and the bench with the bench shirt gives that greater compressive effort and why raw is so much lower than equipped. So that's the difference in power lifting between raw versus equipped. So now we've talked about Olympic lifting, we've talked about power lifting. Now I wanna talk about strongman competitions. So. In 1977, the world's strongest man competition was started. Uh, the idea behind this was, you know, feats of strength of either a pulling exercise, a press, a carry, really lifting various odd implements uh, to display you know, feats of strength. Things like the Atlas Stone, vehicle pulls, overhead press, a keg toss, farmer's walk, super uh, yoke, hustleful stone. Besides the world's strongest man, which has been around the longest, um, going on almost 50 years now, other strongman competitions are the Arnold Strongman Classic in 2002, the World Strongman Federation, the Strongman Champions League. And again, there are some other events, things like the Timber Carry, the Bale Tote, um, Apollon's Axle. And I want to look at and show it and introduce some of you who aren't familiar with some of the different strongman exercises. So this, these are the Atlas stones. They're, um, they're large spheres of rock um, with a weight that varies anywhere from 100 to 160 kilograms. Usually what happens is um, competitors have to take these Atlas stones, lift them off the floor and put them on top of a platform. And the platform usually starts with the, with the lightest stone and progresses to the heaviest. And the course can be anywhere from 16 to 33 feet. Initially, they would base victory on whoever could lift the heaviest stone, but in recent years, they've also focused on who can lift all the stones in the fastest amount of time. So these are the Atlas stones. This is now the, the Hussefell stone, which is based on a legendary stone from Hussefell, Iceland. It's a triangular shaped stone. It's actually called a pen slab stone because it was used as a stone to serve as a gate to let sheep and keep sheep and goats in a pen. The stone, the original stone weighs 410 pounds. And the idea is you pick up this stone, which is again, a very odd implement to carry. And you try to see how far you can carry the stone for distance. The super yoke, again, is a, is a heavy barbell across your, uh, someone's back. And then it either has significant weight on it or heavy tires and the competitors have to carry it for 30 meters and they try to do it as fast as they can. So they squat the weight up and they carry it. And it's called a super yoke because again, it's just like a yoke for an oxen across their back. Um, the current weight that's used is 1,410 pounds, essentially seven tons. Vehicle pull, just like it sounds, um, your, their competitors are pulling a variety of things like trucks, buses, trains, some competitions have even had competitors pull a plane. Usually the, the vehicles weigh anywhere from 10 to 25 tons, and you're looking at how much distance that you can pull it before you get exhausted. So this is the vehicle pull. Keg toss, you're looking at tossing kegs anywhere from that are weigh 15 to 24 kilograms, and you have to toss them over your shoulder, up over your back, over a 14 and a half foot wall. you can successfully toss over the wall. And then the, the last one of the last ones I want to describe is just Apollon's axle. 
This was named after a French strongman, Louis Uni, in the 19th century. He nicknamed himself Apollon the Mighty, and he would take basically a barbell that was made out of the axle of two and two railway car wheels, and he would deadlift this, he would clean it, and he would overhead press it. And that's where um, what athletes will do now in the strongman competition. So that was strongman competitions. Now I want to transition and talk briefly just about CrossFit. Uh, first came about in 2000. It's really a combination of disciplines and exercises. There's a workout of the day. And usually the workouts are components of bodyweight exercises, Olympic lifts, powerlifting exercises, kettlebells, and they're focusing on a combination of strength qualities where it's focusing on speed, strength, endurance, and power. And unlike the facting powerlifting and weightlifting where there are weight classes, there are no weight classes for the CrossFit games. And here you can see some pictures, whether it's a sprint, a one-arm snatch, you can have an overhead squat in the bottom right or erging on the bottom left. So that's CrossFit, again, a combination of a lot of these other disciplines. And then the last discipline I wanted to talk about was, was bodybuilding. Here in the top right, you can see a picture of German uh, Eugene Sandow, who the Mr. Olympia trophy is modeled after. Um, he was a bodybuilder and a strong man in the United Kingdom in the 19th century. And actually the first bot, true bodybuilding competition was in 1901, and it was called the Great Competition. It was held at Royal Albert Hall in London. And interestingly enough, um, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who wrote Sherlock Holmes, was one of the judges. Currently the main governing body in bodybuilding is the International Federation of Bodybuilding and Fitness, but there are some other organizations as well. Uh, again, with bodybuilding, they're focusing on adding muscle mass. You're focusing on isolation exercises to bring about different um, body parts development. Um, they're focusing on a lot of bodybuilding splits or body part splits where they're focusing on chest workouts versus hamstring workouts versus calf workouts versus tricep workouts. And again, they're trying to build as much muscle mass, but also keep symmetry, whether symmetry is right and left side of the body or front and back symmetry. You don't want one muscle group overdeveloped at the expense of other muscle groups. And here are some of the weight classes for men and women competing in bodybuilding. Within bodybuilding, you see some different categories for women. There's the bikini competition. There's also fitness competitions. Um, and then there's the classic physique. That's the one people talk about, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Mr. Olympia, Dorian Yates, um, Lee Priest, things like that. And again, there are judges grading these bodybuilders and athletes on muscle development, on symmetry. There are specific compulsory poses that everyone has to do. And then they do allow for an individual posing routines and you're comparing the muscle development, the symmetry of different bodybuilders. So this is bodybuilding. So that brings us to our, our first act, which was looking at various weightlifting disciplines. Now we're gonna talk about weightlifting definitions. So here's our, our first poll question to launch. A uh, college freshman wants to join the crew team next year. She talks with the team athletic trainer who performs a brief assessment and recommends initial training program that includes five three-mile runs per week and two one-hour sessions per week in the weight room, in addition to two 30-minute sessions per week with a rowing with on the erg, so on the rowing ergometer. She's also given some benchmarks to achieve. She follows the program exactly and consistently without modification for the next year which neglected training principle might affect her performance at tryouts? Is it A, overload, B, specificity, C, individualization, D, reversibility, or E, structural tolerance? Perfect. So it looks like people were pretty evenly split between A and C and E and D. So no one, no one chose D, 
but otherwise it was pretty split. So we're going to go over some weightlifting and weight training definitions, and then we'll come back to this answer. So remember your, what you pick selected. So we're going to cover here some strength movements, some program design definitions, volume, intensity, tempo, time under tension, strength methods, program design splits, and some concepts of periodization. So concentric is the you, how you produce force when the muscle shortens, like the center picture. When the gentleman's doing a biceps curl, you're generating muscle force while the muscle gets shorter. Eccentric force is when you're producing force while the muscle lengthens. In the bottom left picture, you can see some doing what we call a natural glute ham raise or Nordics, where they're lowering themselves down so that hamstring and glute are generating force, but while the muscle lengthens. And then isometric, which is producing force while the muscle length does not change. That's when you're at the top of a plank position, or again, you're doing an isometric hold like a wall sit where the muscle length is not changing. For program design definitions, this is typically when we look at writing strength and conditioning programs, you'll see something like this, A1 push-ups, three times eight, body weight, three, two, one, 30, A2 barbell back squats, three times six, eight RM, two, one, one, 30. And then you see B dumbbell curls, three times 12, 15 RM, one, 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 60. C overhead press, two times five, 70%, two, one X, 90. Well, what is this? What do these mean? So when we look at this, essentially when you see paired exercises like A1 and A2, what it means is you're gonna go back and forth between these two before you go on to your B exercises. You do one, the first set of eight pushups using body weight as the load with a three to one tempo. So that, that, that number after the eight RM or the body weight is your tempo. The last number rests 30 seconds. Then you're gonna perform one set of barbell back squats using the heavy, heaviest weight good lift eight times. That's what the eight RM means. It's your eight rep max, the heaviest weight you could do with perfect form eight times, but no more at a two, one, one tempo resting 30 seconds. And once you've done a set of the, the pushups and then a set of barbell back squats, you're gonna go back and do the second set of pushups, second set of barbell back squats until you've done three sets of each of those before you move on to your B exercises. Now B, because there's no B1 and B2, you'll do a set of 12 reps of curls. You'll rest 60 seconds. You'll do a second set of dumbbell curls, rest 60 seconds, and you won't move on to the overhead press, your C exercise, until you've done all three sets of curls. And the 70% of overhead press is again, the load that you're gonna use, and that's a percentage of your one rep max. So when we talk about volume and intensity, volume is the number of sets times reps. So your volume of pushups on this workout is three times eight, 24 total reps. And volume is usually talked about in terms of an exercise or a movement pattern or a muscle group, right? What's the volume of total repetitions for, for your quadriceps versus your hamstrings versus your triceps? Volume can also be the entire workout. So looking at how many total reps are in one workout and volume can also be with respect to over the course of one week, meaning you're adding up your workouts. If you're lifting three days a week, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, the total load and then total, total repetitions for that whole week. Now intensity doesn't mean how, you know, how much effort you're giving, you know, hundred percent intensity, you're going all out. It's tied into load. So the heavier the load, the closer it is to your one rep max, which is essentially 100% you know, from a percentage standpoint is, the, is a high intensity. So a 70% intensity or seven, is 70% 70 of your one rep max. So intensity is tied into load and volume is your sets times repetitions. Now we also talked about tempo, okay? And tempo is the speed of one repetition and it's the speed of that movement. So here we have a gentleman doing uh, chin-ups um, and on the bottom right, we have someone doing a barbell back squat and usually tempo is expressed as three numbers. The eccentric part of the movement, which is the part where you're either in the chin-up, you're lowering against gravity, right? And the muscles are lengthening or in the squat, you're squatting down. The P is the pause, 
where you're trying to take away or, or change how much momentum is there. And that's the change from eccentric motion to concentric motion. So for example, if someone has a tempo of three, two, one on the barbell back squat, they're gonna lower the weight in three seconds. They're gonna pause at the bottom, that whole position for two seconds. And then they're gonna come up concentrically in one second. Whereas two zero X means they'd lower the weight in two seconds. There would be no pause. And X means they're trying to explode up as fast as they can with, with the load. So sometimes if it's a heavy load, even though they're trying to do it explosively, they, it might not be the, the same speed. Sometimes it can be expressed as four variables, EP, CP, where there's two pauses. And that's something like a chin-up where you might have a pause at the top of the bar and a pause at the bottom of the bar. Why is this important? Well, tempo also, if you're multiplying it over the length of one set, is the total time under tension or tut of that set length. And the greater the muscles are under tension, the more this is focusing on hypertrophy, the more metabolic damage. So if someone's doing three sets of 10 and the tempo is three, two, one, well, that's six seconds per rep at 10 reps. That means it's 60 total seconds, where if someone's doing three sets of 10 and the tempo is two zero X, that's only 20 seconds of time under tension. So it's another variable tempo is that can be manipulated in strength conditioning and in weightlifting. The other piece going back um, to our, our mock sample workout here is the lettering hierarchy and priority in terms of whether exercises are paired like an A1, A2, A3, or it says straight sets, where you're, which is would be A, B, and C, where you're doing all of the A exercise before you move on to the B, before you move on to the C. Whereas A1, A2, A3, you do a set of A1, a set of A2, a set of A3, and then you'd start back at A1 again. And then don't forget rest time, that rest time can really change based on someone's goals or recovery. The shorter the rest time, the more metabolic the exercise tends to be, the less time you give the nervous system to recover. So I think, so that's another variable as well. A lot of times with powerlifting or, or when you're lifting for maximal strength, you can wait two, three, even five minutes in between sets. If you're getting more, trying to focus on more cardiovascular and a metabolic hit, you're gonna have shorter rest times. Now, when we look at program design, the other thing to think about is what your program design splits are. So we talked about in bodybuilding that they'll have a body part split. I'm going to train chest one day, is back another workout, quads, triceps, abs as well. So that's a bodybuilding split where you have lots of more time in the gym and you can focus on individual muscle groups. Another classic split is a push-pull split where people will train biceps and triceps, you're, you're pushing exercises on one day, Bi back and biceps, you're pulling exercises on one day and legs on a separate day. Antagonistic pair split is where you would do, again, biceps and triceps, so an elbow flexor and an elbow extensor in the same workout. You'd have chest and back on the same day and then legs on a separate day. And then also the other type of body part split would be lifting your upper for upper body exercises on one day. So chest, back, triceps, shoulders, lower body, quads, hamstrings, calves on another day. Also, there can be just a total body workout routine where you're doing all the exercises all at once. Uh, movement patterns, you can talk about another way to split it up. You have your pushing exercises, your pulling exercises, your squat and your hinge exercises as well. But again, which one of these you pick depends on your goals, as well as how much time you have for a single workout or over the course of a week. Most of us in turn, or our patients don't have enough time to do a body part split, whereas bodybuilders will spend two or three hours lifting every day because it literally is their livelihood or their job. I wanna to touch on three ways to get stronger, in particular in the weight room, in terms of repetitive effort, maximum effort, and dynamic effort method. What most people use is the repetitive effort method, which is moderate number of sets, higher repetitions, a moderate load. The classic one for this is the DeLorme method, which was three sets of 10 reps. Again, we're talking about higher reps, higher volume, and again, the load medium to high intensity. And this tends to have the highest time under tension 
which is why this is usually good for muscle mass gains. So bodybuilders tend to train in this area. Maximum effort method is the second most common used method. This is your classic five sets of five reps. Um, it's, it's higher number of sets, but lower repetitions. But if you look at the load and the intensity, right, 90 to 100% of someone's one rep max. Um, it's again, a medium time under tension and athletes and power lifters tend to train in this area. But really everyone should spend a little bit of time training in this maximum strength, maximum effort area. Dynamic effort tends to be the least used. It's higher sets and higher repetitions, but a lower load. This is, the, this is the lowest time under tension because you're focusing on speed and power. These are exercises like med ball exercises, plyometrics. And this is where Olympic lifting tends to live because you're focusing on bar speed with the clean and jerk and the snatch. So again, to, to summarize repetitive effort, moderate weights, moderate to high, high rep volume, maximum effort, heavy weights, low reps, dynamic effort, light to moderate weights, low reps, high speed. Now I wanna get into some concepts of periodization. And within periodization, what we talk about is a micro cycle being either one workout, a, a weekly plan. A macro cycle is looking at a whole training cycle. For, for an Olympic athlete, it could be a, that four year period from one Olympics to the next, for a college athlete, it might be their entire year of training season, which is composed of in-season, off-season, pre-season. Macro cycles are then broken down into mesocycles, which could be a four-week block, a six-week block. And then within those mesocycles, you're looking at a microcycle, a smaller amount within the workout in the week. And typically in classic periodization, each mesocycle is focusing on a specific quality, whether it's speed, power, maximum strength, and muscle hypertrophy. And again, what, what classes of, of activity or what muscle qualities you're training varies between the off-season, right, when you may be recovering from an injury or trying to build a base, the pre-season, where you're trying to build up into the competitive season and then in-season. And before I get to, to that sort of concepts of periodization, I want to just go back to this force velocity curve. Um, we talked about the relationship between load, how, how heavy the weight is, how and what the intensity is, and the speed of the bar and the velocity. So one of the trade-offs is the more load you put on the bar, the more you're on this left side of the curve, the, 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 the slower the rate of bar movement, the slower the velocity. So that's where maximum strength is. Then you get down here to, to strength speed, which would be like your Olympic lifts. You get to speed strength where now you're doing focusing more on speed and less on strength to then at the bottom where you're focusing all on velocity and less force. And to put that into context here for exercise, again, your squat and your deadlift are going to be on that maximum strength part. Um, again, your, your clean, your snatch, that's going to be on strength speed. When you get down to speed strength, those are things like sled sprints, jump squats. And again, as you go all the way down to plyometrics and sprinting. So just keep this in mind when we talk about training different qualities uh, within um, periodization. So with periodization, there's linear periodization, there's reverse periodization, conjugated periodization, undulating periodization, and uncoupled periodization. And the classic form of periodization is linear. And linear means you start building this base, which focuses on, again, hypertrophy. That's our repetitive effort, right? Strength. And you start with, with a high volume and you start with a low intensity. And over time, you go from hypertrophy to strength and power and to, to maximum strength. So you're, again, you're increasing the intensity and the load and you're decreasing the volume to build towards, towards peaking. Reverse linear periodization is exactly the opposite. You start with heavy load, high intensity, so, so low repetitions, heavy weight, and you start with low volume and you build towards hypertrophy at the far right. So your intensity and your load decreases over time where the volume increases. So these are classic linear periodization and reverse linear periodization. Well, a newer concept is what we call undulating periodization. 
And that's within a weekly training routine or within a mesocycle, volume and intensity can go up and down. So with linear periodization and, and reverse linear, it tends to basically every mesocycle that's stacked together progresses in that same straight line approach. Here, volume and intensity are, are still inverse of each other. So when you have a high volume workout, it's low, low weight, low intensity. When you have a high intensity workout, you have low volume. But what happens is it waves up and down week to week, month to month. So you can have a high volume week followed by a low volume week followed by a high volume week, but volume and intensity are always opposite and inverse of each other. So this is undulating periodization. And this is what it looks like in terms for athletes is you can prioritize individual muscle qualities and training qualities within a shorter amount of time building towards that competition phase. But again, you can see when the volume on the left is high, intensity is low, but then it waves up and up and down in this sort of sine wave pattern. Then we get to what's called conjugate periodization, and that's where we're alternating different training qualities. So here, instead of focusing on speed for one section and then power the next session and never coming back to it, what happens with conjugate periodization is you have these alternating phases of accumulation with getting high volume and then restitution where you're alternating between strength and speed and strength and speed. So it goes back and forth. So this is conjugate periodization. And then the last one is uncoupled. And uncoupled periodization is actually where you have periods where volume and, and intensity, the load you're lifting, are not synced up perfectly with each other. You could have a week that has high volume and high intensity and a week that has low volume and low intensity. So now the two variables have been separated and uncoupled and that's called uncoupled periodization. So to return back to our initial question about our college freshmen, where the choices were overload, specificity, individualization, reversibility, and structural tolerance. Remember we were split between A, B, C, and E. Well, the answer for this is overload. Which neglected training principle might affect her performance? And why is overload the correct answer? Well, one, specificity is addressed because they did have her doing ERG sessions as a crew athlete. So he was doing two 30-minute sessions each week. So that's why its specificity was still, was not neglected. Individualization, was this program customized? Yes, she met with the athletic trainer who put together her own program So they and they did an assessment. Reversibility, which no one picked, um, was the use it or lose it principle, meaning if you're not training, you're, you're losing some of those muscle qualities. Well, she was good about training over the course of her off season. The overload principle was the fact in this, in this statement, in this question stem, it said she follows the program exactly and consistently without modification. And for overload, the athlete has to progressively increase the load, the intensity, or the volume over time, and she didn't. She did the same program without manipulating anything. So that's why overload in A was the correct answer. So now we're gonna move to the last component of my talk, my, the third and final act, which is weightlifting injuries. And we're gonna go over powerlifting injuries, Olympic lifting injuries, some gym injuries, some common themes, and a couple specific injury conditions. So. Here's our, my second question, and is which is true regarding injury patterns in comparing power lifters to Olympic lifters? A, power lifters have more wrist injuries. B, power lifters have more shoulder injuries. C, power lifters have more knee injuries. D, the top three injuries for both power lifters and Olympic lifters are lower back, shoulder, and wrist. E, lifting belts have been shown to decrease lower back injuries for both power lifters and Olympic lifters.
All right. So it looks like the majority of people picked D and E. All right. We'll come back to this question a little bit later. So let's dive into weightlifting injuries. So the first, the first study I want to highlight comes out of the International Journal of Sports Medicine in 2011. It was covered 245 competitive and elite power lifters. And what they found was that the top three injury areas were for power lifters, the shoulder, which was defined, they, they lumped elbow and, and shoulder together in terms of arm, the back, as well as the hand and wrist. So this was in 2011, International Journal of Sports Medicine. When they looked at the deadlift specifically, the back was the number one area, leg and buttock, which contained essentially a glute injury, a thigh injury, and a knee injury was second, wrist was a close third. For the bench press, again, not surprising, all upper body, wrist was first, shoulder and arm second, chest, chest was third. Again, arm contained the elbow, so elbow and shoulder were lumped together. Again, the, for the squat, leg and buttock, um, which was thigh, knee, and glute, back was second. So what they found from this article was the injury rates for power lifters from this study was 0.3 injuries per 1,000 hours of athlete exposure. The most common sites were the lower back, shoulder, and knee overall. They also found that weightlifting belts increase the injury rate of the lumbar spine. And they found that upper extremity injury rates increased if the power lifter was over 40, specifically the shoulder, elbow, hand, and wrist, or if they were female. They found that female power lifters had a higher rate of hand and wrist injuries, but the big three, lower back, shoulder, and knee. In 2018, in the Orthopedic Journal of Sports Medicine, this is a study of a little over 100 power lifters. They found that back, shoulder, and hip joint were the most commonly injured. They found that women had a higher rate of injuries in the neck and thoracic region. They actually did this chart where they gave the power lifters a picture of the front and back of their body, and they could write where the injury was, and they created these scatter plots. Again, for femur power lifters, thoracic, shoulder, and hip were the big three with lower back and pelvis um, fourth. When we look at the male power lifters, again, that, that lower back and pelvis area and shoulder and then hip and then knee was a distant fourth. By the way, I know these don't add up to 100% uh, percent because people could mark off more than one area. Um, so that's why things add up greater than 100%. What they found was that for the lower back, the lumbopelvic injuries were more common as the result of deadlifting. Hip injuries were more common as a result of the squat, and shoulder injuries were more common as a result of the bench press. Again, which makes sense when you think about what goes into each of these lifts, as we talked about earlier in the powerlifting discipline. This is an article um, from Calhoun in 1999 in the Journal of Athletic Training. Um, this was all done with surveys over the United States um, Olympic Training Center over a six-year period. Here they found for Olympic lifters, so now we're switching from powerlifting injuries to Olympic lifts, the low back, the knee, and the shoulder accounted for 60% of all injuries. What types of injuries were suffered were mostly muscle strains, tendinopathies, and, and ligament sprains. And that was almost over 80%. So four out of every five injuries was either a strain, a tendon issue, or a sprain for Olympic lift weightlifters. What they found also in this article was that most of the injuries, people bounce back pretty quickly. You know, 90% of the people, 500, um, you know, and seven of them only missed one day of training. And 99% of all these Olympic lifters at the United States Olympic Training Center missed only missed less than one week. So again, people were not missing a lot of time for these Olympic lifting injuries. And again, the low back was the most commonly injured site in the study. Again, for, for Olympic back injury was very similar to dancers gymnasts and football players injuring their back. 
They also found that for back injuries in particular, this is why that clean and press was removed. You know, I said it in 1972, it would come back to it. it, was a greater risk of spondylolysis. What's interesting is that the rate, rate of spondylolysis in the general population in sports is about the same, about three to 7%. But with what they found is a high rate with the clean and press of this stress fracture of the pars inter articularis, creating a spondylolysis and then a spondylolisthesis. And so that's why they took out the clean and press. The knee joint in this Olympic lifting study by Calhoun was the second most commonly injured, but most of the people suffered from patellofemoral pain issues. Shoulder joint was the third most. And again, that's because of that extreme flexion and abduction in that snatch position that you can see in the, in the, in the top right image here. And that's why the shoulder joint with Olympic lift under a lot of stress. Well, there was a study in, that was published in 2017 in the British Journal of Sports Medicine that looked at a systematic review of nine articles comparing injury rates and injury epidemiology between Olympic lifting and powerlifting. For Olympic lifting, they found from this study an overall injury rate of 2.4 to 3.3, and for powerlifting, 1 to 4.4 per 1,000 hours of participation. Again, within these studies, they found um, specifically under Olympic lifting that Rask, Norlin, and Calhoun studies showed low back, knee, and shoulder were the top three for Olympic lifting. Kuland found shoulder, knees, hand, and wrist. And in power lifting, they found either shoulder, low back, and elbow, and keo. Brown and Kimball found low back, knee, and chest. Rask and Norland, which also looked at Olympic lifting, found low back, shoulder, and knee. And then the last one we mentioned was that 2011 study showed low back, shoulder, and knee. So again, the differences between Olympic lifting and power lifting injuries were that shoulder injuries were more common for power lifters than Olympic weightlifters, And that was because of the higher loads on the bench press versus the snatch, which are the two exercises um, in the weight in the Olympic lifting and, and power lifting that puts more load on the shoulder joint. Also that bench press position of the humeral head with it, the shoulder joint being abducted and externally rotated made it more vulnerable in the bench press. Knee injuries were more common for Olympic weightlifters than powerlifters. And that was because, as I mentioned, when I went over at the beginning of the talk, the anatomy of the snatch and the anatomy of the clean and jerk, the foot position and dropping into that deeper squat and the ballistic nature of dropping that, that depth puts more stress on the knee joint. The similarities between Olympic lifting and powerlifting were that low back, shoulder, and knee were the top three injuries for both. So returning to our question, which is true for injury patterns, the answer was B, power lifters have more shoulder issues. So Olympic lifters tend to have more wrist issues due to the stress on the clean. Power, um, Olympic lifters have more knee in injuries. And out of the top three, it's lower back, shoulders, and knee not lower back, shoulders, and wrist, and lifting belts have actually been shown to increase injuries. So that's the answer to our second board question. I throw, threw in two more studies that just looked at weight room injuries in general, and I thought this was interesting. This was done, published in 2019 in the Journal of Clinical Physiotherapy Research, where it looked at 46 studies for weight room training injuries, and they really found two mechanisms. One was weight room accidents, which was tripping over weights or equipment or weights that were dropped or falling and people would be injured from the weights being dropped. And then an injury that was from people actually doing an exercise. And there they found the injuries fell into either people trying to lift too much weight, people having a poor technique or people lifting in a too much of a fatigue state. So because they're fatigued, their form and technique would actually break down. So in looking at this, uh, they broke it down also by, by age group. In the, in the younger kids here, they found that kids, 80% of all injuries are accidental, meaning dropping weights um, or tripping on equipment. That's why they had a high rate of hand, finger, and foot injuries. You know, weights getting, hand, fingers getting crushed between weights, weights being dropped on their foot, where for older adults in the, in the adolescents in the 20 to 30 range, 
it's more trunk and core injuries and muscle pulls that you tend to see. And then the last study I wanted to talk about was in 2018 in the Journal of Orthopedics. There they looked at 25,000 weight training injuries and they found that almost half of them were sprains and strains. And they found that in terms of acute versus chronic, most injuries were acute injuries, a muscle pull, dropped equipment, that only 30% were more chronic and overuse. And the most common acute injury here in this study was dropping weights and, and people getting injured from that. 30% of all injuries were, were technical errors and fatigue and overloading led to 80% of all acute and chronic injuries. So again, there you see it again, technical issues, fatigue, and too, and too much load. And to bring it back home together to put injury risks for weight training in general, this, this is a good chart that shows bodybuilding um, injury rate per thousand workout hours is about 0.12 to 0.7. Again, powerlifting one to 4.4, but that article from 2011 looked at it 0.3, Olympic lifting, strongman competition. And then the last thing I want to quickly go through is talk about three main injuries. One is uh, pec major rupture. So, and again, with the pec major, you have your clavicular head and you have your sternocostal head. And the sternocostal head is the one that gets ruptured and is much more concerning. 80% of all pec major ruptures happen on a bench press. So you're gonna see this in your power lifters. It's more common in 20 to 40 year old males. Athletes who are using anabolic steroids are at greater risk. And it's the site of the lesion relative to the muscle origin insertion that we wanna look at. So for pec major ruptures, we use the Tietgen classification, which looks at the site of the lesion relative to the origin or the insertion. So a type one is just a pec contusion, type two is a partial tear, type three is a full rupture, but type three gets further expanded with a series of letters. And initially it was A to D, they've since added E and F, but a type three A, which is a full rupture, but the rupture happens at the, at the origin at the sternum. Type B is in the muscle belly itself. Type 3C is at the myotendinous junction. D is where the muscle insert, the tendon inserts on the humerus, um, but there's no bone involvement. Whereas E, there's now a bone avulsion plus the tendon at the humerus is ripped off and F is a complete tendon rupture. So this was the, the initial one where it looked at one, type one, two, and three, and then three A, B, C, and D. But as I mentioned, they've added in E and F with, it, with bony involvement as well. So the number one site tends to be a type 3D, which is a tear at the tendon insertion on the humerus. You get edema, ecchymosis, and hematoma. Ideally, you want these fixed if they're gonna be fixed surgically as quickly as possible. So an acute injury is anything that's less than three weeks old. After three weeks, you get tendon dehiscence of the humerus and degeneration and fibrous healing. Again, in looking at who gets fixed surgically, your type one and type two injuries, the contusion and partial tear, do not get fixed surgically. It's the ruptures. Um, even if it's ruptured off the sternum or if it's a mu muscle belly rupture, they, those don't get fixed surgically. The myotendinous junction, some people will fix them, some people won't. But D, E, and F will always get fixed surgically. So that distal tendon rupture. Second injury I want to talk about out of the three is the dorsal wrist impingement. This is a common injury you'll see in CrossFitters, gymnasts, Olympic weightlifters in particular. It's a repetitive hyperextension injury where the wrist getting bent back. If you look in the bottom position, again, that bottom of, a, of either a front squat, a catch phase, or the clean, a bench press, or a push-up, it's this repetitive hyperextension and axial loading of the wrist. Basically what happens is the dorsal or the distal edge of the radius impinges on your carpal bones. Usually it's the dorsal ridge of the scaphoid. And with that repetitive loading, the joint capsule around the wrist can become thickened and pinched. A lot of times it's the extensor carpi radialis brevis tendon 
or scaphoid that gets pinched together. Again, you can see in this bottom position of, a, of the catch phase of the clean, how the wrist is bent, bent back and loaded. A lot of times x-rays are normal, same with MRI, because this tends to be more of a dynamic condition where the tissue is only getting pinched in specific conditions. Treatment tends to be conservative. You try to avoid some of the exacerbating activities, try to avoid the wrist getting extended past 35 degrees, sometimes putting on a wrist brace, um, and sometimes doing a cortisone injection into that, that cap joint capsule. If conservative treatment doesn't work, then we talk about arthroscopic surgery, um, removal. Here's a, here's a wrist scope where they're looking at that impinged um, tissue to clean it out. They'll then wear a wrist splint for two weeks post-op. You'll rehab back to activities, and it can sometimes take six to 12 weeks to regain normal wrist strength. So that's dorsal wrist impingement. The last one I want to talk about before I, I take time for questions is distal clavicle osteolysis. It's also called weightlifter's shoulder. It's an overuse injury where you have repetitive excessive load of the AC joint. Um, usually what causes pain are activities that where you're having horizontal abduction, regular adduction, internal rotation, forward or lateral rota uh, flexion of the shoulder. So exercises like a barbell bench press or an overhead press are two things that will put stress onto this. Again, the, the, the histiological mechanism is it's micro trauma to that subchondral bone of the distal clavicular head, which leads to subchondral cystic changes and disruption of the articular cartilage. A study in 2017 in translational pediatrics, they did MRIs of almost 1,500 students who had shoulder pain between the ages of 13 and 19. They found distal clavicle osteolysis in about six and a half percent of those 1,432 cases. And again, out of all of these cases of distal clavicle osteolysis, only one in four were in women. So the majority of these are in men. The history tends to be insidious and onset. So again, that chronic overuse pattern, pain on palpation over the AC joint, they tend to have full range of motion except for extremes of abduction and internal rotation. They tend to have a positive Hawkins test and pain with a scarf test or cross-body adduction. Here on x-ray, you can see again, some irregularity on the distal clavicle. X-ray tends to be sufficient to evaluate. You don't need to get an MRI or further imaging. And diagnostic MSK ultrasound is replacing MRI as a good uh, tool to further confirm the diagnosis, just pulling in your, your ultrasound machine and ultrasounding a patient's AC joint. Risk factors of who gets this? Well, the more often you bench press, if you bench press more than once a week, also the load, right? There's that term intensity, the heavier weight. So if you bench press consistently more one and a half times your body weight, so if you weigh 200 pounds and you're consistently bench pressing over 300, that's a risk factor. Um, duration, if you've been bench pressing heavy and frequently for more than five years, that's another greater risk. If you're doing the barbell bench press versus dumbbell bench press or kettlebell bench press, that's a risk factor. And if in your workouts, you're doing much more horizontal pushing like bench press, incline, decline bench press versus pulling exercises in the horizontal plane, like a T-bar row in the bottom left, or a chest supported row or a one arm row, that's a risk factor as well. Uh, the treatment, almost over 90% of the time, you can, be, you can treat this conservatively. Activity modification is really great. If you have them go from having a wider bench press to a narrower bench press, um, usually if it's less than one and a half times the biochromial width. So if you look at the pictures in the bottom, right of our, our screen, you see this gentleman's biochromial um, width is 40 centimeters. He'd want to lift um, no wider than 60 centimeters. The other piece is if you decrease the bench press depth, so lowering the bar all the way down to the chest puts extra stress on that distal clavicle. So you'll see some people use what's called a board press, which is that bottom, bottom right picture 
where the person's lowering the weight down, that shortens the range of motion in the bench press. Also, if you switch to doing less barbell bench pressing and more dumbbell and kettlebell bench pressing with a neutral grip, so instead of a pronated palms away grip, you turn your arm in to lower the weight down, that puts some stress off of the AC joint. Also, if you change up your push to pull ratio, um, for, so for every, every rep you do with horizontal pushing, like a bench press, you're doing two or three reps of horizontal pulling, that can also help correct this imbalance. So these are some conservative treatments and physical therapy. Other conservative treatment options are AC joint corticosteroid injection. They're also looking at botulinum toxin injection to the AC joint. Currently, there's no current literature supporting PRP or other orthobiologics, but I think stay tuned to the next 5, 10, 20 years, and that may change. <clears throat> Surgical options are essentially resection of the distal clavicle. Um, you don't want to take off more, though, than eight millimeters of the distal clavicle because otherwise it creates more shoulder instability. And this can be done usually arthroscopically, but in some cases it needs to be switched open to an open surgery. So that's distal clavicle osteolysis. So in summary, we covered a lot tonight. Um, we talked about a lot of different disciplines within weightlifting. We talked about some specific weightlifting definitions. And then we talked about what types of injuries weightlifters get and three big ones in terms of pec major rupture, dorsal wrist impingement, and distal clavicle osteolysis. So these are my references. And then these are my, my two daughters with pictures taken 10 years apart and their hockey careers and their strength training careers. And I will take some time now uh, for questions from everyone. Thank you so much for, uh, for sticking around. I know we covered a lot of material. And I'm happy to answer questions for as long as people want. Thank you, Dr. Mancini. That was a lot of good information. And for everybody, the, the first question with the training principles, that's a good example CAQ question. So thanks for including that on there. Um, to start off, question, I know we talked about sort of general body areas that are most injured with powerlifting versus Olympic lifting. Are there, have you seen there to be more injuries with certain lifts in particular, just overall? I, I would say in terms of powerlifting, I see a lot more injuries with, with bench press, um, just in terms of people either not using a spotter appropriately or, or lifting too much load. I thought the, the one article from in the Journal of Orthopedic Sports Medicine that talked about you know, the, the, the issues with technique and load and fatigue um, I think I see a lot of that. High school athletes, specifically male athletes, I'll see a lot of um, barbell back squat injuries um, because people, when they get on that bottom position, instead of driving with their legs up, they'll go try to have their back go forward and then come back first, which will have cause a lot of muscle strains in their, in their lower back. I, I tend to see less injuries with Olympic lifts because people tend to practice the Olympic lifts like the the clean and jerk and the snatch a lot more um, consistently and religiously. And so they tend to sort of respect the technique. Whereas I think people who get, who go to the gym and work out tend to have more technique flaws in the barbell, in the squat, the deadlift and the bench press. And then we have a question from Josh Romero. Any thoughts on shockwave for the distal clavicle osteolysis? Oh, Josh, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, we have not used, we have not used a shockwave on distal clavicle osteo, uh, osteolysis. Um, typically we've used it on, you know, patella tendon, Achilles tendon, you know, those sort of, you know, you know, uh, medial and lateral epicondylosis, but, um, it's a good thought, um, to, to think about, but I'm not aware of any, uh, literature or research on it currently. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, Dr. Mancini, you kind of were getting into this, but with CrossFit, have you seen like one particular injury the most by far over some others, at so least from I, your practice? Yeah. I, so I think that with CrossFit, and it, it's funny because with CrossFit, with a lot of the workouts of the day where they talk about, you know, 
as many reps as possible or as many rounds as possible, they build in a lot of you know fatigue, right? And, and the studies have shown if you want to cause an injury, bump up the weight, bump up the speed, and bump up fatigue. And a lot of CrossFit workouts will do that. So I haven't seen necessarily like one exercise within CrossFit. I will say for me and my strength and conditioning background, I'm not a fan of, of burpees because I think it can, it can beat up your knees, your shoulders, your lower back. Um, I think there are other conditioning exercises. I also have seen injuries where people are doing a high volume of box jumps and, and getting injured where they can, you know, they can hit the box, they can miss, mess with their form or their technique. Um, but, I, but on the flip side, I'd say, you know, look, you know, CrossFit will teach the clean, they'll teach the snatch, the deadlift, kettlebell swing, you know, and, and do a good job instructionally. So I think it's more within programs as the fatigue accumulates that you'll see more injuries. It isn't one necessarily CrossFit exercise. All right, we have a question from Andrew Hui. Uh, any thoughts as to why belts seem to correlate with more back injuries? Maybe a false sense of security uh, of support. So, I, so that's a really good question. I think there's sort of two components is that when you're wearing um, a lower, a low back belt, you're taking the stress off your normal core muscles. And so your core muscles aren't engaged or activated like they would be if you weren't wearing the weightlifting belt. I will say if you do a deeper dive on some of the weightlifting belt research, it's more the fact that like, if you're always lifting and doing, let's say barbell back squats with a belt, your core is not consistently engaged to get stronger. In fact, when they've done like EMG analysis of barbell back squats um, without a belt, they'll find your core is extremely active. Like, the squat is a great core exercise, just like the chin up and the pull up are a great core exercises. And so people think it's because if people are wearing the lifting belt all the time, they're never getting that training. Now on the flip side, if you're doing the training most of the time without a belt, but then every once in a while you're lifting heavy and putting a belt on, then the belt can have a protective effect. But we're talking about wearing a belt when you're lifting like, you know, less than 1% of the time. We have a question from Sydney Vo. Any thoughts on training programs created by chat GPT or any patients coming to you with training programs from there? I, I have not. And I think that's a, that's a good question because one of the things when I see athletes in our sports medicine clinics for injuries or for recovery, I'll have them bring in their lifting, their programs for their team or whatever, as they're trying to progress back. And I'll go through it with the athletes to make some tweaks or corrections on it. But I have not seen anything on, uh, on chat GBT uh, yet. I was very interested by that question, having explored a little bit. It's pretty amazing what chat GBT can do. We have another question from Griffin Albert. Have you seen any literature regarding injury rates in CrossFit in general? Their instructor training emphasizes mechanics and consistency prior to intensity, but it seems that this isn't always followed. Yes, I think the, the CrossFit, the literature that's out there in the CrossFit, some studies will has, has said, you know, that the rate of injury for CrossFit is no different from a lot of the other weightlifting dif disciplines that I sort of quoted like powerlifting and Olympic lifting, like that one to four, you know, two to three, you know, injuries per thousand um, training hours. There have been other studies that have said that that injury rate is is higher. Um, you know, there's a study that was published in the um, by the NSCA, the National um, Strength and Conditioning Association, one of their journals that then was was retracted um, because it looked like the data was skewed a little bit. Um, so again, I think the, the data that's out there for CrossFit is sort of all over the map. Again, you know, I think if you, if any sort of good strength coach, you know, I, you know, for me having done this for, for over 25, you know, almost 30 years now, the first rule of any good strength program and strength coach is don't get your athletes injured doing your program in the gym. The second rule of a good strength coach is you know, decrease your athlete's injury risk in whatever sport they're doing. And the third goal should be improve their performance in whatever sport. So if you have a soccer player, you know, don't get them injured in the weight room doing your program, decrease, let's say their ACL risk, you know, ankle sprain risk when they're on the soccer pitch, 
And then third, improve their overall soccer performance. Um, so I, I agree, it should always be technique first. And when I have younger athletes, I always will tell people stop one or two reps short of technical failure. So not physical failure where you're trapped under the bar, but stop one or two reps short of technical failure. That way you make sure their last rep and their first rep have, have just as good form. And especially for people starting out that are, that are new. And I have a question from Steve Lubert. With the snatch, are shoulder injuries most from the catch? What about the injury rate during the pull of the snatch? Yeah, so so usually with the shoulder, it's that it's that catch phase where you're dropping and the and the shoulder is sort of abducted overhead um, in that vulnerable shoulder shoulder position where you're up here, not that not that second pull. That doesn't mean it can't happen, but if you had to sort of have a blame pie of which section it's going to be more that 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 catch phase. Okay. And another question from Josh, did you find the CSCS certification or experience contribute more to your current knowledge base? It seems this certification would help provide a new lens outside traditional medical training. Any resources you recommend for programming? Yes, yeah, so I, I, I have found it helpful. Um, I got certified before I went to med school even um, as a way to sort of have a, a layer of sort of knowledge just for training and exercise. Um, I like as a resource, their essentials of strength and conditioning um, by the NSCA is a, is a good is a good resource book. Um, I also will will give a, a shout out to Dan John, um, who has a couple good books um, on on basic strength training stuff. One is intervention, and one is can you go? Um, again, I have no financial investment in his books or any or any of these things, but um, but I think those are good resources as well. All right, I think we're done with the questions. We've got, got a lot of good questions and answers here. Um, everyone, if you haven't filled out the survey already for feedback, please do. And thank you, Dr. Mancini, that was wonderful. Oh, my pleasure. And thank you for everyone who stuck around um, to for the entire talk and for the questions. Have a great night, everyone. Good night, everyone.